The following sermon is from Al Rudy, Senior Pastor at Faith Baptist Church in Danville, Illinois. If you've never reached out to Faith before, we'd like to hear from you. Visit our website, faithdanville.org. That's faithdanville.org. And now, here's Pastor Rudy. Let's take our Bibles and go to Daniel chapter 4 this morning. We're going to continue this uh, series now in this book of Daniel. And in this fourth chapter, we have a personal testimony about how King Nebuchadnezzar was converted and uh, became a changed man. But it was definitely a hard road to humility. The entire fourth chapter is a testimony to the greatness and the wonders of our, of our Almighty God. And as we read this testimony from Nebuchadnezzar today, we're going to see the work of God in his heart and examine the remarkable series of events that God used to bring this man to faith in the true and living God. And so what we have here in this four chapters is what I would call a personal testimony booklet. That's what we have. And this king is using this to distribute and tell the whole world what God had done in his life. Now, there are really three parts to this booklet. The first uh, part would be the preface, and that would be the opening verses, where the king gives praise and thanks to the Lord. And you know, those of us that are saved today ought to do that same very thing. We ought to give a testimony about uh, the Lord and how he saved and changed our life. And I, you know, the thing is, our personal testimony is one of the most powerful things we have, one of the greatest tools we ever ha will have in witnessing to those that are lost. The Bible tells us in Romans 11.33, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. It's just a great thing to be able to tell people out there uh, what God does, the ways of God and how He works in our lives. We read in Psalm 107 and verse 2, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Here's another verse for you. Psalm 66, 16 says, Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. Isn't that a great verse? When's the last time you declared to other people what God has done for your soul? That's what he was saying in that psalm. And uh, so I, I do believe that everyone knows that our safe should give that testimony and tell somebody how Jesus saved our soul and changed our life. So this booklet gets... That gives us the preface in the first three verses. And then beginning in verse 4, and right on down through most of the rest of the chapter, Nebuchadnezzar Nezer gives us the proclamation of his salvation. He closes with verse 37, where he says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, those that walk in pride. He is able to abase. Nebuchadnezzar went through that road, and he knew exactly what he was talking about. So he closes out this booklet with a postscript of praise and adoration to the Lord. Now this morning, I want us to think about this amazing conversion experience of this king. I think it is one of the most astonishing conversion experiences you're ever going to find recorded in the Word of God. It all revolves around a dream that this king had. So let's take a look here this morning into this outline. I want to notice, you know, notice first of all the dream that was received. Beginning in verse 5, Nebuchadnezzar tells us of this amazing dream that he received. But let's take a look at the setting first of all. Look at verse 4 where the king Nebuchadnezzar says this. He said, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing, that word means prospering, in my palace. Okay, so we know from history there were a lot of battles that Babylon uh, was involved in. Those battles were now over. The army had surrounded the city, had placed protection around the city of Babylon. Here's the king walking around in his palace. He's content. He is secure. He's extremely wealthy. He's prospering. And in the midst of all of that, when things were going great and all was well, we're told that he received a dream. That made him terribly afraid. Look at it in verse 5. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. So he had a terrifying dream. You could say it was a nightmare. And uh, now, we left off last time in the end of chapter 3, and we saw back there that uh, God was at work in the heart and life of this king. 
In fact, we saw way back there in chapter 1 how God allowed this man, Nebuchadnezzar, to go down to, to Jerusalem, uh, besiege it, and then conquer it. And then we saw God working in this king in chapter 2 of this book when he revealed to him this dream that he had of a great image and uh, just unfolding pro future prophecy. Then in chapter 3, we saw him building that golden image of himself. And as that episode unfolded, Nebuchadnezzar uh, sees the miracle-working, awesome power of God in that fiery furnace experience with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But remember this. Keep in mind that all of this that was happening shows us that God was at work in the heart and life of this king. It's amazing that God has his ways of working and his ways of, of bringing people to that time and that moment when they're going to turn to him for salvation. God just does a great work in our life too. All these different providential uh, events that we can look back at now and see the, the hand of God in them all. And that's what God did here with this man. He has a dream and it makes him deathly afraid. That word afraid in verse 5 literally means extreme terror. So this was a terrifying nightmare that he had. God, you could say here, is reaching into his bag of terrors. He brings this horrific dream to the mind and heart of Nebuchadnezzar. And what this tells us is God does have his ways of getting our attention. I was talking to somebody not too long ago, I think just this past week or so, and, and they were relating to me uh, what God was, had done in their life just to get their attention. And, and, and here this man cannot even, you know, sequester himself in the palace. He's so wealthy, he's so protected he may have thought that even God was not going to be able to break through where he was, but we know that wasn't the case. And so look at now, if you will, at verse number 6. He said, Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, and I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. When you just read those, look at those two verses with me, what did you think automatically? I thought, here we go again, right? I mean, we've been down this road before. The king calls in all of his so-called experts, right? He brings in his brain trust, so to speak. And it just looks to me like this guy was a slow learner. I mean, you would have thought he'd have learned his lesson by now, right? I mean, back in chapter 2, he had that dream, and and uh, he knew it was important, but he, he was troubled. Nobody, he couldn't even remember what it was, let, let alone know what it meant. And so here he goes again. He does the same thing, goes, brings these same people in, all these different so-called experts. Not one of them could provide for him the meaning of this dream. You know, I, uh, I, I think about this so many times, a statement that Winston Churchill once made years ago. And really, it is unwise never to learn from our mistakes Winston Churchill said this one time, the one thing we have learned from history is that we fail to learn from history. And he was right about that. You know, but I think it's really a part of our sin nature to repeat the same mistakes. And that is exactly what Nebuchadnezzar is doing here. He's going back to the same old sources trying to get his answers. And really what you have here is the definition of insanity. You've probably heard this before. What is the definition of insanity? It's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Now, this is the way many people are in our world today. They're looking for answers. They've got serious problems in their life. They want solutions for them. Uh, and so they've got all these fears and problems and difficulties, and yet they go to the same old sources that, that, they, that they've gone to before, and they don't have the answers. They go to the secular psychiatrists or the psychologists. They turn to politicians or the educators. They, they turn to the radio and TV talk show hosts of all people. But when it comes right down to it, not one of those sources can give you the answer to the deepest problems of the human heart and life. And so after the experts fail them again, as a last resort, maybe as a flashback, the king turns to Daniel. Look at it now, if you will, in verse number 8. It says this, But at the last Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, in whom is the Spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the Spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubles thee, 
Tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. All right, so when all else fails, the king finally brings back in his trusted counselor, Daniel. And as we've read, as we read through this account, we're going to see something here. As you look at Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, as they, as they have this uh, uh, communication together, it seems like Daniel had a special love in his heart for this crusty old sinner. It just looks like he has developed a compassion for this pagan king. And knowing Daniel the way we do as we read through this whole book and how he was such a great man of prayer, I do believe he'd been praying for this man, Nebuchadnezzar, to come to know the true Lord. And so, what happens? He's a man who has the answer, isn't he? Daniel's the one man who understood the meaning of this dream. You know, that tells us right now, thank the Lord, there are always going to be some people that are in the world today who have the answers to life's problems. And who are those people? People that know God. People that know the Lord and His Word. We are saved. We know the Lord personally. We know the Word of God. And it's the Word of God that has the, deep, the answers to the deepest needs of the human heart and life. It's like we sang today. What's the answer? Jesus saves. That's where it all begins, right there. And so did you notice, too, how that Daniel doesn't do any bragging about what he knew? Never did that, did he? Reminds me of Joseph. Joseph always gave the credit to the Lord for the dreams that he had and, and giving him the, the interpretation of them. That's exactly the same way Daniel was. A humble man. He always gave God the glory, took no credit for anything. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar's the one who's bragging about Daniel. We are told this in Proverbs 27 and verse 2, Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger and not thine own lips. Three times in this chapter, Nebuchadnezzar's saying that the spirit of the holy gods is in Daniel. Now you say, well, that's a kind of a strange thing to say, isn't it? Well, it kind of is. Um, and really, he doesn't, he's using the language here of a pagan, unsaved person when it comes down to it. And, and uh, I mean, really, he doesn't understand spiritual things. And so he is using all, the only words he does understand. And what he is really saying, though, is there's something different about this man, Daniel. Now, in the world today, uh, we, ought to, we, we, we go around, we live amongst those that aren't, aren't saved, and, and the world ought to be able to see there's something different about us as well. When they look at our life, you know, I don't care where we're at, you can be at work, you can be at school, out in the community or in the neighborhood, people ought to be able to know that you're a Christian. They ought to be able to see the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. Jesus talked about that. In Matthew 5, verse 16, he said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Now, not your good works because you're, you're such a good person. No, it's God's work in you and God's work through your life. That's what he was talking about. He said, When they can see that, they'll glorify your Father who is in heaven. So unsaved people out there in the world today ought to be able to see the Lord Jesus in our heart, you ought to be able to see him at work in our life. And if they do see him in our life, then I'll tell you what, they just might turn to us in their time of trouble and desperation. Just like Nebuchadnezzar is turning to Daniel here. They just might approach us and share with us the deepest needs of, our, of, of their life, okay? They've looked at our life and they've been able to determine, man, that, that person is, is different. That, there's something about that Christian that I don't have. I need it in my life, and I want to find out how I can get it. And so they just might uh, want to come to us and, and inquire us about what we have in Jesus Christ. So beginning in verse 10, Nebuchadnezzar begins to tell Daniel about his dream. And the thing that was so disturbing about his dream was that he saw this dream of a giant tree that was cut down cut down right at the root as we go through this account we can see that the words move from from it in verse 11 you see about it talks about this tree and and how it was strong and, and all and in verse 12 it talks about how it was meat for all and, and, and the beast of the field had shadow under it so it talks about it in verse 11 and 12 but then it changes to his in verse 14 what that means is that i believe the king right here is discovering that for himself, that this tree is picturing him. That God was talking about him. I mean, he's the one who's a great king and uh, a mighty man. But now 
he's met his match in the Lord. God is sending him a message in this dream. Nebuchadnezzar, you are going to be cut down. I don't care how lofty you may think you are in your own eyes. You're going to be cut down at the root. And that is what was so disturbing about this dream that brought terror to King Nebuchadnezzar. So the dream was received. Now let's move on. I want you to notice the next thing here, and that is how the dream was revealed. In verses 14 to 18, Nebuchadnezzar finishes up telling Daniel what he had seen in his dream. So beginning then in verse 19, Daniel starts to reveal what this dream meant to Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 19, if you will. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished. That word means astonished for one hour. And his thoughts troubled him. Now, can you imagine this right here? Daniel was literally struck speechless, is what this is talking about here. I mean, he, had, he, he didn't know what to say. And I mean, he, was, he, was just, he was just so stunned that he just uh, stood there uh, for one solid hour and he could not talk. So you got this trusted counselor, Daniel. The king had just got done telling him about his dream, how he was so troubled about it. And Daniel just sits there in stunned silence with amazement about what this dream meant. Now, I can't imagine what Nebuchadnezzar was thinking as Daniel was just sitting there for a solid hour without uttering a single word. I can only imagine the tension, right, and the, and the suspense that must have been filling that room. So we got 60 minutes going by, nothing said at all. Finally, the king breaks the silence. And notice what happens in verse 19. The king spake and said, said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. (laughs) So he's saying, okay, Daniel, don't don't be upset about this thing now. Um, And then he goes on to say this. Uh, It says, Belteshazzar answered and said, my lord, the dream be to them that hate thee and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. What Daniel's basically saying right there is, King, I hate to say it, but there's some very bad news for you. I wouldn't wish this upon your worst enemy. And obviously Daniel's upset. He is burdened about this. And by the way, keep in mind, Daniel's a prophet of God. Right? God God is telling him exactly what he's going to do. He's telling him the future. He's God's spokesman. And sometimes the man who delivers the message of God has a message that is extremely troubling to people. And that's what was happening here. Same thing goes on today with preachers who have been called of God to proclaim the truth of his word. It's God's message. Now, like any preacher, I love to preach on messages like heaven and the love of God and the grace of God is mercy. I would much rather preach on those wonderful themes than to have to preach on subjects like hell and the wrath and the judgment of a holy God. You gave me the choice, i choose the former, not the latter. But here's the thing. God commands preachers to preach the whole counsel of God, the whole Bible. And that includes some subjects that are very troubling to a lot of people. And we can tell that Daniel felt the same way here Okay, he's a, he has a message from God. It's very disturbing, but he knows he has to give it to the king. Waits an hour, but he begins to give him the, the meaning of his dream. Notice what he says here. In verse, let's go down to verse 22. Here it is. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven and thy dominion to the end of the earth. What Daniel's doing here is pretty much what the prophet Nathan did that day with King David when he pointed his bony finger at him and said, you're the man. You're the man. You're the guilty person here. And and so sometimes the preacher has to deliver a difficult and a strong message. And we know this, that sadly our modern generation doesn't want to hear that kind of preaching. They don't want to hear it. They want a preacher who's going to make them feel good and more comfortable, right, And uh, so they'll flock out, right? I mean, you got tens of thousands of flock out to churches like that with preachers like that who are going to uh, just, you know, just give nothing but good, positive, upbeat, feel good type of messages. And that's the way people are today. They they would say, tickle my ears, preacher, but don't you dare step on my toes. That's the way people are. So what's happened? 
in this generation. Tragically, preachers have basically uh, watered down the message today of the gospel of the Word of God. They failed to preach against sin. They failed to preach the truth because it's too offensive to people. I call them cowardly, weak-kneed, spineless preachers. They'll soft-pedal the message so much that they won't preach anything that'll even come close to being portrayed as negative. But the Bible clearly teaches a message of judgment at times. And so Daniel is saying here to this king, hey, King, I hate to tell you this. I would wish this on your enemies instead of you, but I've got some terribly bad news that's going to happen to you. It's on the way. And then after Daniel delivers that bad news, he gives it here in the next number of verses, chapter, verses 23 to 26. He then appeals to Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 27. After he tells him what's going to happen to him, he said, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness and thy iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility, or that means peace. Now, today God's preachers are doing what Daniel was doing here. They're sounding out warnings to unsaved people. They're sounding out that warning. They're preaching repent, just like Daniel here. Repent, turn from your sin, trust Jesus, or God's judgment's going to fall one day. One of these days, that final alarm is going to be sounded and the warning bells are going to ring for the last time for people. So we come next to verse 28. And there's a little gap here between 27 and 28. It tells us there that all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. Now what, how long was that gap? Twelve. It was one solid year. Verse 29. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And so here it is, 12 months later, he's walking around in his palace and, and one day and he's boasting about all these wonderful things that he had done. Look at verse 30. The king spake and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built from the house of the kingdom by the might of my power for the honor of my majesty? Now look at what the Bible says next in verse 31. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. Now, back in verse 25, we are told that the very same day that Nebuchadnezzar was going to live with the beasts of the field, he'd be made to eat grass like an oxen. And here's what it says, seven years would pass until he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men. All right, now let's go to verse 33 and notice what it says. Just what, it, just what had been prophesied takes place. Verse 33, that same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And then what happened? Well, all of a sudden, just like it says in this verse, the king's eyes begin to move back and, and forth, and just like that, just like that, his reason. His sanity, his mind left him. Okay, it was just gone. He looks at his hands and they're growing hairs. He looks at his fingernails and they're, they're growing. They eventually become like bird's claws. And, and then look what it says in verse 33. It says that he was driven from men and he did eat grass as oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his tails like bird's claws. Can you imagine the sight of that? He, it's, uh, here he is. He rushes out into the thickets of the Euphrates River. The man has become like an animal. And by the way, um, I've read this. There is an actual medical condition that is sometimes mentioned in connection with this particular passage of Scripture with Nebuchadnezzar. It's a medical condition known as lycanthrope. It's made up of two Greek words, lykos, which is the word for wolf, and anthropos, which is the word for man. So lycanthrope literally means wolf man. Now, it is, it is an actual, and it's a rare medical disease. It's been recorded from time to time in history. People with this disease 
literally lose their mind. They actually think that they're an animal. Some may think they're like they're a dog. And they'll take on the characteristics of a dog. Others think they're a cat, and they take on those characteristics. Now, I should have been doing this. i got to tell you this right now, up front, okay? But years ago, while I was still not saved, so let's make that real clear. I can remember as a teenager, on Friday nights, I lived in Rockford, Illinois. On Channel 13, WREX-TV, they would show these scary movies. You know, teenagers with scary movies. And I remember sometimes it was Frankenstein. I can't even remember all the other ones. I do remember Frankenstein, and I do remember the werewolf. And there were times, I mean, I tell you, when that man turned into a werewolf, I just about choked on my popcorn. <laughs> I mean, it was scary. It was frightening. <laughs> the point is this. Sin will turn a person into where they're almost just like an animal. Right? No morals. When people sin and start living like a heathen, sooner or later, they actually begin to look and act just like an animal. And the problem with that, of course, is God created us in his own image. Right? I mean, think about it. God created you and I to be like himself. The Lord wants you and I to be an upright man or woman. He's created us to be like his son. And that's so that he can have a close, personal, and intimate relationship with us. But here is this old king, Nebuchadnezzar. He is now living and acting just like an animal. And think about it. This went on for seven long years. How could a guy ever come back from that? I would venture a guess that Daniel and his staff, no doubt, had to govern the affairs of of the kingdom during that whole seven-year period. They may have tried to keep the thing hush-hush, right? There would have been neighboring nations that would have jumped at the opportunity to invade Babylon while this military genius and great leader had lost his mind. I can imagine the rumors that were swirling around all over the place during those seven years. I mean, think about that. That's a long time. Hey, where's King Nebuchadnezzar? We haven't seen him in public for a long, long time. What are, you, what are you trying to hide here? Is he seriously ill? Is the man dead? What, what's going on? And I'm sure that the leadership of Babylon had to be tight-lipped about this whole thing. What happened to Nebuchadnezzar? But now remember, God had said that the stump of the tree would grow again. Daniel knew that. And sure enough, I want you to notice what the Bible says next in verse 34. It says this. Look at the first part of that. And at the end of the days... The end of the days. I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Our Bible tells us in Psalm 127, or 121.1, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. That, of course, is talking about lifting your eyes up to God. The first step towards spiritual sanity is to lift your eyes and heart toward the God of heaven. The first step is to always come to God and to have that that personal, intimate relationship with him. That's exactly what happened in Luke chapter 15 to the prodigal son. If you remember, that prodigal son was just like Nebuchadnezzar in the sense that he was living like an animal. He was right down there in the hog pen, living with the hogs and living like the hogs. But then it says this, that he came to himself. He got his sanity back. And when he came to himself, he said, I will arise and go to my father. Now notice that. It was when he came to himself got his spiritual sanity back, that he went to the Lord, that he came to the Father. A person has returned to sanity when they make up their mind, I'm going to get back to God. (laughs) I'm going to return to the Lord. And really, the truth is, it is insane for a child of God to fall into sin and drift away from their Savior and Lord. And sometimes God 
has to do what he did here. He has to do, take things in his own hands and humble that person. Sometimes God has to put a Christian on their back before they'll ever look back up to the Lord. Now Daniel knew what was going to happen. He knew what was going on here. In verse 36, Nebuchadnezzar spoke of the, of the same time that his reason was returned on him. So Daniel, remember now, he knew exactly how long the king's insanity was going to last. He said it back there, verse 25. Perhaps he had it on his calendar. Maybe he was numbering off the days. Now the, the day came when he finally could see that those seven years were over. So now Daniel knew it was time to go out on an expedition and fetch the king. The last time they had seen Nebuchadnezzar, he was growling like a wild animal. But that wasn't going to stop Daniel. They got their crew together, they went out there and, and, and uh, they saw him. And when Daniel sees him, he's an entirely different person. When they meet up with him, the, here's the king singing praises to God. There is no question about it. He has been miraculously converted. He is a totally changed man. And the application is so simple, but it's, and it's obvious. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ can do in a person's heart and life. It does not matter how deep into a, a, per, a, sin, a person going to sin or how long he's gone into sin, uh, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how animal-like his behavior may have been. The mighty God of heaven who loves us and wants to save us can do just that. And he can transform our life by his grace. This was an amazing conversion. King Nebuchadnezzar thought so much of it, he was so grateful what God had done in his life that he put it into writing and made out this personal testimony booklet. You know, folks, that tells us right there, we who have been saved ought to do the same thing. You can put it into writing. I know I've done that over the, in the years past. I've written it down. I've got it typed up somewhere. It's on a file. Nobody knows anything about it but me and the Lord. A long, drawn-out thing what God did in my life and the events that led up to my being saved. We've got to put it in writing. And not only that, but we ought to, we ought to go out there, and, and we're so grateful that we want to tell other people about what God did in our heart and life, just like Nebuchadnezzar. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, who's delivered us out of the hand of the enemy. So Jesus did that. He saved our soul. He cleansed away our sin. He changed our life. The least we can do is to make it public. And to tell other people about what Jesus has done for us. We had to write a letter, send an email, tell somebody about it. Sing a song or share a testimony with a friend. The least we can do since our Lord has saved us and changed us from the inside out and set us free from the enemy and given us a new nature is to spend the rest of our life praising his blessed name. May God help us by his grace to do that. If a pagan king could do it, so could we. To give honor and glory and thanks to the Lord by living a life that is pleasing in his sight. Let's bow our heads together for closing prayer. Lord, thank you so much for the work that only you can do to transform the heart of a pagan, proud, stubborn king. Lord, if you can save him, you can save anybody. We can say the same thing about ourselves, Lord. If you can save us, you can save me, you can save anybody else. That's the power of God. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today who's never had that happen in their life, never had the Holy Spirit of God grab a hold of their heart, bring conviction, and draw them to a saving knowledge of Christ, I pray that this might be that day, that glorious day when they themselves personally turn to Jesus, turning from their sin, trusting in him to save them. Lord, I pray for those that are, of us that are saved here today. I pray, God, that it will mean something to us. Enough that we'll write it down, that we'll tell other people about it and make a practice of that, Lord. If it's been a while, help us, God, to see the need of telling others what you have done for our soul. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
You've been listening to Al Rudy, Senior Pastor at Faith Baptist Church in Danville, Illinois. If you'd like to learn more, visit our website, faithdanville.org. That's faithdanville.org. Thank you for listening.